All right, it's one minute after the hour. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I, there's a few items on the agenda this time. I, I kind of sorted the agenda items by simplest to most complicated slash unknown to me. Um, so that hopefully we'll be able to uh, make sure we get to the, to the simpler ones before um, uh, diverging into you know platform specific chair NFS and other stuff that have um, had had you know might be may involve a lot of discussion. So uh, if you have if you have other agenda items, uh, also now would be a good time or you mentioned on Slack. So somebody has some feedback. Hopefully it's not me. I think it was Kirk. Oh, okay. Yeah, Kirk, do you uh, have anything to add to the agenda? If not, I'm going to try to figure out how to mute you. Or maybe you muted yourself. Cool. Um, cool. Uh, anything, any other agenda items folks want to add? All right, then let's get started with um, fast clone deletion. I think, Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to what you wanted to add to that besides just advertising it? Yeah, um, so this is a feature. Um, it now has review, reviews open um, for both Lumos and for ZMS on Linux. Um, I am seeking reviewers. I sent out an email about the uh, feature flag change um, yesterday, so hopefully everyone um, got to take a look at that. Um, yeah, in general, we're trying to kind of figure out like how much review does this need? Um, who wants to weigh in on it? Um, we've been running it at Delphix for 10 months or so, um, and there aren't a ton of code changes between the various platforms and between what we have running um, internally. So it's not like a ton of changes um, from like what we believe to work, but still like I think people should look at it. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions about it if there's anyone who's taken a look at it but doesn't like know where to get started. I can talk a little bit more about the areas I'm changing if like that is useful. But yeah, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that slash wants to volunteer to start looking at it. Yeah, I guess the first question is, uh, do we have anyone who's ready to volunteer now? Uh, if not, then uh, I'd be interested to hear from um, from Brian as to uh, what review you would like to see for ZFS on Linux specifically, given um, you know, we've already had a bunch of uh, a bunch of people have reviewed it when it went to Delphix, and I think all those reviews, you know, apply certainly apply to the Illumos version as well. Um, the the Illumos PR since the changes to there were pretty negligible, right? Yeah. Um, and the changes to the Linux one, uh, I think they probably apply there as well. We might want to have someone else just check over, um, to, you know, do a quick look at it. But um, I think we have quite a, you know, quite a few folks that reviewed it internally uh, with with minimal changes. So, any volunteers? All right, feel free to get in touch with us um, after. Um, Brian, do you have any thoughts on what you'd like to see, what additional review you'd like to see? Hopefully, Brian is here and looking for his mute button. I know he's usually one of the uh, phone call-ins. I just pinged him on Slack, but we might have to come back to this. Okay. All right. Well, we'll come back to this if he joins or finds his mute button. Oh, he says he's here, but he can't unmute. Oh, interesting. Um, Karen, you. Uh, <laughs> Someone has the unmute. Not being able to unmute is a feature, not a bug. Oh, yeah, that's true. Not be able to unmute other people. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Deck two says unmute with star six. That is neither me nor my cat. <laughs> How do I tell who it is? Uh, Christian, I think your mic got unmuted accidentally. And you're making you a lot of noise. Might need go. to put the clutch in before. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. Cool. All right, we'll, um, we'll get back to Brian. He said he would call back in. So let's move on to the next agenda item, um, which was uh, Luke, uh, are you on the call? Uh, Luke wrote in asking about um, FIPS 140-2 certification. Yes, I'm on the call. Can you all hear me? Yep. Um, do you want to kind of set up where you're coming from and what you're, what you're looking for here? Yeah. Um, so uh, I work for a defense contractor and um, fairly new to me that business um, but I've been using ZFS for a while and I'm seeing a lot of places where it could be applied in the defense industry um, and one of the requirements for doing so is what they call FIPS which is Federal Information Processing Standard and uh, it's, it's a way to get uh, encryption certified for use for stuff related to the US government and I don't know the full process for that but I know that other stuff like um, DMCrypt has already gone through the process, um, but I could see ZFS on Linux with its native encryption um, being a, a wonderful replacement for DMCrypt um, if it's able to get the same certifications. And it would affect other industries like healthcare, finance, um, researchers, because some of those fall under the same uh, FIPS 140 requirement. Do you know if it's possible? Certification for anything is doable, just really, really expensive and time consuming. Do you know if it's possible to get that certification for the source or is that something that you would get for a specific binary build? I think it's for a specific binary build. I'm, I don't know if it's possible with the source. Um, it, it is definitely outside my area of expertise, but I'm willing to, to put in legwork or do whatever I can if it's, if it's helpful. If it's yeah, I can do service for binaries. Um, I do a lot of compliance and certification over here, so I'm also happy to do whatever I can to help out. I might actually be useful for once. Is it, um, how does the ZFS module that people use on Linux distributions get built today? Is it built in a central place and shipped out to lots of different people or is everybody basically building it on their local system? Uh, it depends on the distro, I think. So like, uh, you know, Ubuntu provides binaries um, and they are probably the only major distro that does so. So like folks using it on Red Hat are probably compiling it from source um, as far as I know. Uh, and um, other folks outside of Linux might not be aware, but the, the actual encryption implementation that's used by ZFS on Linux is the Illumos one um, that, that was ported from, you know, the Illumos uh, whatever it's called, kernel encryption framework with okay. Linux. So I'm sure that like at some point, Sun slash Oracle, you know, got that stuff certified. Um, but again, but, that would be for specific. Yeah, presumably that was for, like each right. release, you know, it, that was like the Solaris 10.7 right. um, binary was certified. So uh, it seems like it would be tricky for the project to uh, do that kind of certification. If it is on a like per binary or per release basis, it would make more sense probably for a distro that's going to be saying like we're shipping, you know, Ubuntu version seven and like we, we, we certified ZFS, the ZFS that we shipped the Ubuntu version seven is FIPS 142. Brian, does that, I know we talked about this a little bit before. Does that jive with your understanding as well? Yeah, that matches my understanding pretty well also. Um, I would also point out that we do ship binaries for things like CentOS and RHEL, but they don't come from CentOS and RHEL. They're binaries the uh, ZFS and Linux project hosts. Okay, so folks might be using those centrally built binaries. Yeah, probably. So like in theory, it, it, it could be possible for the ZFS on Linux slash OpenZFS project to 
go through that, given enough money and effort. <laughs> you presumably yeah. would have to keep doing it for each, uh, yeah, for each really binary, basically. Something that actually might make things a little easier. I did some digging into some of the documentation I have because we're we're looking at some of this kind of same kind of stuff over over here for uh, entirely non ZFS related uh, products, but. Um, source code uh, validation is, is also something that we can do. It is looked at during the, the, the uh, uh, validation process. So, But my understanding for open source projects, uh, what we can do as a community, I, I guess, is to just prepare ZFS to be easy uh, to, to be certified. So what we can do, for example, add a bunch of if devs uh, that uh, basically, so you are able to easily exclude encryption algorithms that are uh, that cannot be part of FIPS uh, and do stuff like that. So we cannot really, uh, it doesn't really make sense to certify OpenZFS as a project, but it, it would help other vendors that build products on top of OpenZFS to, to have this component uh, uh, to be easily certified because each vendor has to actually submit his own product and, and this product has to be certified. So we can just make this process easier as a community. Gotcha. Yeah, it's definitely gonna be the easier, the easier way to go is sort of is like provide like an alternate, you know, build, um, sorry, alternate set of build instructions that would remove the stuff that, that isn't compliant. Um, if we wanted to start doing a binary build, um, for the community that was, uh, that we could get FIP certified. Um, I can definitely see what I can do on my end uh, to help sponsor support that. Um, I'm sure I've got some room in my, button, in my budget this year. <laughs> Are there any specific requirements with regards to the reproducibility of the build? As has been stated, most times when you're certif getting a certification from FIPS, it's for a specific release. If they are allowing software, that is a change because it used to be it had to be a particular machine with a particular version of the software on it configured a particular way. I'll point out that Windows was able to get certified for being secure, but the, cert the environment they uh, submitted for testing had no networking. Yeah, so I think um, probably we need to do some more research here if we want to pursue this. Um, one nice thing that kind of relates to your question is that the um, my understanding is that the actual crypto, the certification applies to the like encryption part, um, which is a separate kernel module. Um, I'm not sure how much, if at all, the, the certification would really depend on ZFS per se. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, because they're going to be looking at the entire system, not just what uh, crypto cryptographic algorithms are used. You have to use a specific, uh, I'm not going to say anymore. There's actually a Wikipedia on FIPS uh, 140 people can go look at. Yeah, I, I've looked at it, but maybe I didn't totally understand it. Um, all right. Well, it sounds like uh, Luke, maybe connect with some of the folks here that are really much more knowledgeable than I am. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as a community, we're, we're probably willing to do, to, to help out in like, you know, if there's, like you said, build options and stuff that we can do to make it easier to do that certification. That's cool. Uh, I don't think it's some, probably not something that like the project is going to be undertaking, um, you know, from a top-down approach. I imagine that'd be especially yeah. difficult with Linux just because, uh, different distros are going to have a different version of the kernel. So you would end up with a different binary even, right? Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, every yeah, distro yeah. would have their own, right? And we get and, crazy. I mean, every time they rev the kernel, they would get another one too. So I have no idea how that process would look like. Yeah, Alan makes a very, very good point there. Mm. Um, it, it should also be noted that we can do the work to get ourselves FIPS compliant. Um, there's no official usage for that term. So we, we could do the work to make it easier to build, um, like what was suggested earlier, you know, have, have proper, have option, you know, option flags to take out the stuff that wouldn't be compliant. And we could say that, you know, it's FIPS compliant, but not that it's FIPS validated. And then let, you know, people pull that stuff down and do their own builds and go through the headache on their own. 
we can do that right now because it's using uh, <laughs> FIPS approved algorithms, to be honest. Yeah. Well, and pro problem solved, no work needed. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yay, but actually, I'm not sure uh, for, for, for encryption itself, yes, but uh, we have a bunch of uh, uh, hash algorithms that probably are not FIPS compliant. And also, uh, I think uh, FIPS also includes how you use random number generators and uh, what kind of number generators you use. So uh, there might be more can, than just the yes. FIPS allows, um, but you have to have for, yeah. You can have more than they allow. It's just that when you go to configure it a particular way, it has to be FIPS compliant for the validation. So having extra cryptographic algorithms, hash algorithms, et cetera, is not a problem for that. They just have to be able to, it has to be able to select the ones that are approved. Sure, that's good. Uh, cool. Uh, Luke, did you have any kind of last last words or comments on this before we move on? Uh, no, appreciate the time. I'll put my contact info in the chat. So if anybody wants to reach out regarding it, and I'm going to do some more research and legwork and, and see what resources I can pull at work. Cool. Thanks. I'll, I'll put my info in there too. So if anyone can make use of anything I'm doing, just you know, let me know. Hit me up. Happy to help how I can. Thanks. Uh, so let's circle back to the um, reviewers for Fast Solution now that uh, we can hear Brian. So Brian, the question for you was, um, what, it, what additional review would you like to see before this goes into Linux, um, given that you know it's been pretty thoroughly reviewed? The Linux version has been pretty thoroughly reviewed, um, and I think we could have somebody do another you know, uh, once over of the Linux version. But what, what additional would you like to see? I was going to say that this is actually looks like it's in really good shape to me. It's been seen. I actually volunteered myself to review it, so I got a chance to look over it uh, at least a little bit. And um, yeah, I didn't have any real complaints. So I think it'd be great if we could get another reviewer on the Linux side to look at it and see. But uh, I mean, it held together through all the automated testing. You guys have done a ton of work testing it at Delphix, so it seems to be in great shape. So I don't have too many reservations about it. I mean. Just a little more testing, and uh, I think we could pull it in. All right. And is this something that you would wait until ODA is tagged first? Or well, that was my it? initial intent, but um, I mean, possibly I didn't expect this to show up, so it wasn't in the original plan. Um, particularly something that's been baked this long already. Um, so I was thinking after 08, but um, we'll see. Would it be useful to get it in sooner? Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> but it depends on when ODA it is, right? Like, yeah. we're we're trying to yeah. get all, you know, we're trying to not carry a ton of diffs, so we'd like to get it upstreamed, you know, sooner rather than later, so that we can, you know, have our product tested on, you know, the um, with all the features, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, but mm -hmm. it's also not like the last feature we're waiting on. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's not, yeah. So then it probably makes sense. I would think to put it in after 08, like we can get 08 tagged as soon as humanly possible. And then this can go in right afterwards. Yeah. I mean, like I think last time, last meeting you said that 08 would be tagged in February or March. So a, oh, yes. <laughs> is that still the plan or is it, uh, it moves out a month every month. <laughs> Well, well, February is looking pretty unlikely. <laughs> um, but uh, but the only thing blocking it, if you want to circle back to that a little bit, our trim, which also needs reviewers, and there's a pull request that went up for that uh, a couple weeks ago. And then um, some of the fixes we talked about before for encryption that still need to go in. Uh, there's a pull request Tom open for that as well. Um, those are the two big things. And I know I need to look at both of those. Um, but if we get those in, then we can get it tagged pretty much. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, one other dependency I noticed for this is the um, the BP obj work that I think Paul was doing. Um, that will probably mm -hmm. have some, some conflicts with this. Oh. Okay. Oh okay. yeah. Reiterate part right because you might the must free. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll just take a look at that. Yeah. So just we should take an order for them. Yeah. 
Cool. Um, so let's move on to the next agenda item, which uh, was should compressed arc be mandatory? Um, Alan, Jude, uh, you brought this up um, on the GitHub, and uh, thanks for leading that discussion. Do you want to? Can you? I guess first start by summarizing, like, what what would the real change be here? Like, what would the impact be? Um, and then uh, if you could kind of summarize the discussion so far. Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, since George introduced compressed arc, it means that uh, when we read blocks from disk, we store the on disk version in the arc uh, rather than decompressing it first. And then uh, if we do need, if it is compressed, then we will decompress it uh, every time it's read from the arc. Although there's a small, I think it's the debuff cache that makes sure we don't decompress it repeatedly uh, in a very short time span. Um, it caused a bit of complication with the way the L2 arc works uh, related to previous work that George Wilson did so that the um, checksum for the version written to the L2 arc device is the same as the on-disk version. Uh, whereas previously, I think it was uh, always LZ4, so it was different. Um, the intent there was to avoid storing a different checksum as part of the L2 arc header. Uh, instead, just piggyback on the checksum of the block pointer. Um, so that means if you disable compressed arc, the copy in the arc no longer matches the copy that's on disk in the main storage. And so when you go to um, feed the L2 arc, you might have to recompress the block. Or uh, yes, if compressed arc is off, you might have to recompress the block before you write it to the L2 arc uh, to get the same checksum when you read it back from the L2 arc sometime in the future. Um, and this can cause a problem um, if your compression algorithm doesn't actually produce the same result every time, uh, which can happen if you're mixing software gzip and the quick assist offloaded gzip uh, because they use a different reference table or something. Uh, or if, for example, using Z standard compression and uh, you're using a newer version of Z standard now than when you originally wrote the blocks to disk. Um, and so a question became, um, does anybody ever turn the uh, compressed arc feature off? Uh, and if, if nobody does, then maybe we could uh, avoid having to make more special cases for the L2 arc in that case. Uh, but uh, some people have made reasonable cases for why you might want to, although I don't know that anybody has made the case of they actually do disable the compressed arc. Uh, there was also today a reference to a, another issue on uh, the ZFS on Linux GitHub, uh, where apparently if you poke some uh, file in slash sys to erase the or dump the caches, uh, it causes a panic when you try to read from the arc. Although well, I don't know if that's that was um I, I, that was how it was originally filed, but then um, the the person who reported that updated it to indicate that the issue was actually when they had turned off compressed arc. If you used L two arc at all, then system blew up. So it seemed like uh, at least on on Linux, maybe uh, compressed arc disabled plus L two arc like just doesn't work. Which, which would indicate that nobody's using that combination. Um, now, there might still be people using, setting compressed arc to be disabled and not using L2 arc, um, which might be impacted by, you know, making compressed arc mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. I know that the um, encryption work changed uh, how some of the feeding and reading back from the L2 arc works to support encryption and so on. Uh, and so it's quite a bit different from the code that I did all my original testing on, on FreeBSD, which was from before uh, the crypto stuff. Uh, and I had hoped the crypto stuff might have the answer to the problem, but it seems it might actually have a worse version of the problem. Yeah. Huh. Um, so I, uh, was there any more kind of summary of the existing discussion that you wanted to bring in? I kind of agree with you that like people have people have raised theoretical concerns that seem like theoretically valid, um, but 
uh, you know, definitely we were kind of trading off here between implementation complexity uh, and ability to add new features and improve existing, you know, compression algorithms and stuff uh, versus, um, you know, some, some performance if folks have made this change, you know, have changed this set tunable and um, are really taking advantage of it. So I think the, the most useful thing would be feedback telling us like, oh, actually like we're using, like we, we need to be able to disable the compressed arc because this is the workload that we're doing and it's really important for us. And then, you know, that would kind of let us know, okay, we, we really shouldn't rip this out. Um, if we hear silence, then I think that that's kind of, uh, I think we would tend towards uh, ripping out the functionalities so that to make this other stuff simpler. For what it's worth, um, the compressed arc has demonstrably increased the efficacy of the arc in a number of Postgres systems that we have. Like we just store a lot more stuff and like the IO latency that we experience is the disks. It's not the decompression. So take yeah. a go. Yeah, like I've seen Postgres benchmarks that say it's faster to have the compressed arc because you end up writing less data to the disk. Right, because you, the, the tendency of the arc is substantially increased. In fact, we we have we, we did some performance investigation at some point where there were recommendations to increase Postgres's buffer size at the expense of the arc, but actually we get better tenancy from the arc because it's compressed. So actually, shrinking the Postgres buffers enables more. Because uh, you know you get between one and two times the bang for buck in terms of actual cache data in, in the compressed arc. So I, I I don't I don't know. I think we are unlikely to ever disable it in, in any of our stuff. I think because we we've, we've just never noticed either the latency increase or the CPU usage overhead increase really. Yeah, and that's similar to what George found when he wrote the feature originally. I think it was uh, they had a working data set that was close to a terabyte, but the machine couldn't physically take more than 768 gigs of RAM. Uh, and then as soon as they turned on the compressed arc, it all fit in 400 something gigs of arc and everything right. was happy. I don't think the implementation complexity of uh, a toggle for compressed arc is that bad. It basically, it's there's a check in a bunch of places in the arc is, is this block compressed? Since because compressed arc has to support the fact that the block on disk might not have been compressed and therefore will stay uncompressed in the arc anyway, there's not much implementation complexity to the, comp the ability to disable the compressed arc, but it is in this case uh, possibly creating more complexity with other features that might have a, a weird interaction. Although all of those seem to be around the L2 arc and maybe the solution is to fix the L2 arc. I don't know. I think there are probably yeah. a number of other things that need fixing in the L2 arc, to mm -hmm. be honest. So. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I think that in the in the short term, like absent anybody taking on the work to, you know, do an overhaul of the L2 arc, um, the the issue is that, you know, it would remove a lot of the complexity, and the um, the complexity with respect to the L2 arc, and also the um, constraints that we have to put on ourselves with the compression algorithms, right? Because um, we need, because because if you disable the compressed arc and you have an L2 arc, then we have to be able to like regenerate the original compressed data when we write it to the L2 arc. Um, we have to be able, like, we have to have the original compression algorithm. So, you know, you would have to, if you wanted to like, update your LZ4 algorithm in a way that's like de compatible with the decompression, but it, it's, you know, smarter about how it compresses, maybe it uses like a big, it uses a little bit more memory to, for the like tables that it's generating or whatever. Um, then you have to be able to do it both ways in order to get the old data. And you have to be able to distinguish like, oh, this, this was compressed using the, you know, with the 16K table, versus the 32K table. And so we have to like, when we recompress it, recompress it using the 16K table. That's that's the complexity that I'd like to avoid. Um, I think prim that's primarily the complexity I'd like to avoid because that spreads out to more of the rest of the system, right? Like the, having, having the L2 arc have to recompress it is like, it's annoying, but it's 
const constrained to the L2 arc, which, you know, is not exactly like the most beautiful piece of code anyways. So, uh, like, I, that's not a huge deal. It's, it's more the constri putting the constraints on being able to improve the compression algorithms and be able to use, like, you know, like you said, both the, the um, C gzip implementation as well as the gzip um, offload engines um, in a compatible way. Okay, well, uh, going once. Yeah, if anybody else wants to comment yeah. in the, uh, the GitHub issue, I think we can continue the discussion there and see where it goes. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, we'll, we'll take that as kind of positive feedback towards, um, towards uh, getting rid of the, um, or towards making compressed arc mandatory. It's probably a good way of studying it. Yep. Saying it. Just the last moment, I'd like to add a comment that uh, unless something changes, we probably still don't have mechanism to directly read the right data uh, to the ARC buffer, ABD buffer, by passing uh, DMU cache, which means we're still doing another memory copy, which probably costs half of decompression time, which makes disabling decompression is close to pointless. But probably there is a difference, but not as dramatic as it could yeah. be. Yeah, I totally agree. That was uh, something I wanted to look at for uh, Z standard in particular is uh, it has some function where it might actually be able to take the scatter gathered list of something like ABD and act on it instead of us having to make a linear buffer before we feed it to the compression or decompression algorithm, uh, which might be uh, yeah. an advantage there. That might help. Um, we did some research on that a while back for LZ4. Um, and uh, kind of like what Alexander was saying, um, the like for LZ4 at least, um, the difference between just doing a B copy and doing an LZ4 decompress was pretty small. So um, eliminating the copy, like when you do LZ4 decompress, we're like first we copy it, the compressed data to be linear, and then we decompress it. And basically eliminating that copy, we think would have very tiny uh, impact on overall performance. Um, but, uh, well, and I mean, that's like one of the fastest decompression algorithms. So like ones that are slower to, to decompress would have even less of it, you know, the, the B copy has even less of an impact. Um, but, you know, it, hey, if, if they've got it, like, sure, like, let's use it. Cool. Um, so, George, uh, do you want to talk about the platform-specific share NFS? This is something that um, George brought up, I think, last meeting, and um, uh, finally sent out the specific proposal uh, yesterday. I'm not sure how many folks had a chance to read it before this meeting, um, but uh, maybe, George, if you want to summarize what the proposal is, and then um, you maybe summarize the existing feedback. Uh, sure. So, oh, we lost you. Can you guys hear me? Okay. How about yeah. now? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Great connection. Um, so, so yeah, the concern uh, originally when we started this discussion was that there are certain properties which um, are on an on disk component that when you were to, to import a pool would cause ZFS to take certain actions. And if you start doing this across platforms, uh, it was kind of undefined what that behavior would be. So if you brought in an Illumos pool that had some you know, platform specific property, what would it do when it came on FreeBSD or Linux? Is that you know, something that we you know, need to be concerned about? Um, my opinion is that, yeah, it is something Thing that we probably should be concerned about. I don't know how many people do cross-platform um, you know, imports, but it is a feature of ZFS and something that I think we want to kind of, um, you know, keep track of and make sure that we don't break. So the proposal that I put out there was to try to create a platform-specific uh, 
uh, infrastructure for properties that would allow you to define different behaviors based on the platform. Um, and so this way, if you were to import a pool that, say, for example, had ShareNFS set, it would recognize that the ShareNFS property had been set on a different platform than the one you're importing on and would simply ignore whatever contents were there. Um, and likewise, you know, would only get read and evaluated when it came in on a platform that um, it was originally written on or that it was intended for. Um, so that was kind of what I, what I sent out. Um, I would say right now, you know, it's probably early on the feedback that um, has been provided. Uh, I think, you know, initially it was, well, we really shouldn't have this kind of functionality um, and we should just allow the vendors and uh, distros to kind of decide how they want to implement these types of properties, kind of coming with a user-defined type of model. You dropped out. Um, I think there's some drawbacks there. Uh, I think, really okay, am I back? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. So I think, I, I think with user-defined properties, um, as a community, if we want to go that direction, it really starts to go towards a path where we're deprecating those features because then anybody can define them the way they want. The code doesn't really need to live in ZFS. Um, if it's, if it's important for us to have these types of properties, I think they're really, or, you know, to, to take action on some of these um, types of features like NFS or iSCSI or SMB, I think that needs to be closely tied to ZFS and probably needs to remain as a, as a uh, native property, again, kind of my opinion. Uh, so I think the feedback so far has been kind of mixed. Um, uh, there's kind of a couple tweaks to the proposal, but I think they're all kind of in the same vein that we would try to come up with some kind of nomenclature that would tie a, prop, a property to a specific platform or distro. Uh, the granularity there, I think we can all decide on, you know, how granular we want to make it. Um, but overall, I, I think if we want to have a platform specific property, it's the infrastructure, you know, can accommodate that. So I think right now we're still kind of waiting to see, you know, if there's more feedback or if people have feedback on this call. I had a question for Josh. Um, I, you had some, you, thanks for your feedback on George's proposal. I read it and I'm not sure I totally understood your, um, your kind of counter proposal on the implementation details. I was wondering if you could um, talk about like, it, it wasn't clear to me if, if your proposal was to have the behavior, was it really about like the like a command line flag to specify the operating system as opposed to like the what George has said about like a suffix on the property name, um, or was there like some was there an additional you know functionality functional difference from what George was proposing that I was missing there? Uh, well, so I I think the the biggest material difference in the way the properties would be applied was that uh, I was suggesting that we could also have a, like if you wanted to keep for whatever reason, the, the way that it works today, that you could basically, but that by default, we would arrange it so that it did not work that way. It works basically the way that George is describing, but with a slightly different uh, veneer essentially on top, basically from an interface perspective. Like I think that we, uh, rather than add a bunch of new alias, aliases where the, the name is included in the property name, I think we, we could make it like a field that's sort of mostly hidden from people most of the time, basically. And we could probably do that without changing any of the, any of the APIs, uh, even in the libraries, really. Like we could add new APIs if, if you wanted to manipulate, like you could add an extra field if you wanted to manipulate that specifically but i think that in general you would just be operating on the properties from your particular operating system which again is quite similar to what george was saying i think i think it's a good idea like that the, uh, regardless of how it ends up looking i think that it working this way is probably the right way to go um, and and i also i think we should probably be somewhat resistant to uh like i i understand what garrett is saying about the user property stuff, but I think that's a very appliance centric sort of view. Um, and I think like appliance vendors that aren't releasing 
most of the software that they've stuck on top of ZFS can continue to do whatever they want in their in their thing. I mean, if they're already using user properties to achieve this, then there's really not going to be any change for them. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so for as far as the kind of um, material difference from George's proposal of uh, being able to continue doing it the old way, um, in, you know, indefinitely, uh, is is the use case for that like that like if you're using very simple share NFS and it, uh, value a very simple value for the share NFS property, then it does kind of work more or less. Like, yeah, I mean, so if, you, if you're just on, yeah, that, that would continue to work. Right, I would think so, and and I, I would also think that it's possible that in the future we could align on a limited subset of values mm -hmm. that work everywhere with even with some translation perhaps. Yeah. But like, you know, I, I, but I also don't think we have to solve that now. I think we can do the, I think that the, the core part of the proposal that it's very uh, important is the part where we're trying to make it not unsafe to import a pool on a different operating system basically. And yes. then slightly further down the ladder from that is to do something useful in the face of importing on two different operating systems. And, and yeah. I think that either what I'm talking about or what George is talking about or some combination of the two of those meets all of those needs. So it seems like the way to go to, have, to effectively not try and translate them uh, as part of yeah. the base mechanism. And because and like each one of these properties is going to be different too. And in the future, we might introduce new native properties that are only interesting on one operating system. And I think that that's fine. You know, like, um, yeah, like maybe there's some new type of sharing that like is only implemented on Linux or whatever. Right, you know? right. Like, like specific like, presentations yeah. of extended attributes is only really makes sense yeah. at the moment anyway on, on each operating system. So, or if we get the per V dev properties, maybe you're setting scheduling settings or something that only makes sense. Right. Yeah. Specific. Right. And you could yeah. totally have different expressions of those on, on different operating systems. And, and I, yeah. I don't know that the user properties is the right, uh, if it is something that lives in the ZFS code base, it seems right for that to continue to be a system property. Yeah. So I, I think, think, yeah. I mean, I think the key thing about these properties that makes them operating system specific is that we're essentially taking the string, like we're essentially taking the value of this property and just like passing it to some operating system specific utility with like no, you know, like you put whatever, like you can set your NFS equals like whatever string you want and we'll pass it down to like the OS specific mount program and it'll do whatever it does with that, right? right. Like we're, we're invalidating it. We're making sure that it makes any sense. So um, that, I think that's what makes it really operating system specific. I mean, you could imagine a thing, you could imagine like if we, had implemented it a different way or for some future thing, like let's say like share AFP, right? Like Apple share protocol. We, we could say, okay, like the, actually the value is something that ZFS knows about, right? Like you said, Apple share equals like, you know, purple and like purple is something that ZFS knows like, okay, great. Like all of your files, when you share it, we're, are going to become purple. Like, you know, you look at them in the finder and now they're have a purple tint on that. Um, and it, it, as long as ZFS is the one interpreting that and implementing it, then like that totally makes sense. And if you bring it to some other platform that doesn't support purple, then it's like, well, like where it says like, if value equals purple, then you just like knock that out or, or whatever. But the, the thing that's problematic is that we're not doing any of that. We're just like, here's right. a string, pass it to the OS utility. It's, it's, a con it's concrete rather than abstract effectively. Like, but that's also, uh, that has benefits too. Yeah, in that, in that we don't have to keep changing ZFS. Exactly. When we add new mount flags, you know, I mean, because yeah. uh, like you'd have to basically have implemented like a NFS export, like domain specific language, basically. Yeah. Um, that you, you know, and, th and then it would need to expand to cover all of the options that exist and all of the different configurations. So it's, I mean, it's, uh, you, I can see why it was done the way that it was. Yeah. Um, I see, uh, Alan, um, you had some comments on the text. Do you want to 
I'll uh, put it, them in the email. They're not important. Okay. I wasn't sure. It seemed what like you were thinking about run user properties, and you know, we were kind of or just namespacing. Maybe the at makes more sense to make it more like the feature flags uh, oh, okay. type of stuff, so that you know we have a share of NF, uh, share NFS property, and it's an alias for the kind of hidden property that's OS specific or whatever. But you can sure. still see and change what the value of sharefs at Linux is from yes. FreeBSD, so that when you import it on Linux, it'll work. But yeah, I think that that was part of George's proposal. Uh, he was yeah. just using the underscore character, and it sounds right. like you're proposing like maybe making it more like the other thing we've done before, instead of coming up with a, a different yeah, sure. instead of using up all the special characters. Yeah, that makes sense to have, to use an at instead of a underscore. Yeah, similar to how we do feature flags or the user quotas and yeah, yeah. It kind of namespaces it that way. We can have an arbitrary number of um, the additional ones without having to have every one of them have a value or whatever. Yeah. We don't have to and enumerate then, the set of possible OSs that could exist or whatever. Yeah, and the at is already kind of a reserved, like, special character in the property news. Other discussion around this? I'm not sure how well it scales, but it seems like a slightly better way to go at it. Yeah, it, it, definitely scaling issues here. <laughs> well, I mean, I think critically, you each operating system or distribution or whatever would would in this world hopefully be able to pick which properties what? they demonstrate as being a first class one. Yeah. So, like, you could just totally opt out of having share iSCSI altogether on your platform, for instance, if you don't want to support it. And, and you could arrange to have it be an error to set it on a platform that doesn't support it without also specifying which other operating system, you know, um, and then just like any, it would accept any foreign token, but it's like, like oh, we don't support that on, on this one. Yeah. And it seems like you, it might not be super elegant, but you could, easily extend this to like, if we decide it's going to be per operating system and then you're like, Oh, but like on my Linux distro, actually we do it differently. And the string doesn't make sense from other Linux distros. It's like, all right, fine. Just like set your platform name equals, you know, Red Hat or whatever. And yes. then it'll just like ignore all the other values, just like it always does. And you have to set it on your platform for it to, for it to yes. change that. Cause I think it's more appropriate to think of Red Hat or, or Ubuntu as being the operating system rather than Linux per se, because all of the surrounds that you get, like all the user mode stuff, is kind of pick and choose. Maybe uh, as a point, so even there might even be a large enough difference between Fedora. Sorry, is that sound? Is that sound working? Or it's a, it's a little loud. Very loud. You're you're clipping. A little. Another one that uh, I think Richard Elling brought up was, uh, you know, on Linux, there are four different iSCSI things that it could be. Uh, and so maybe just at Linux or whatever doesn't make sense. And instead, the name of the specific iSCSI server or whatever. Right. In the but part, of, again, part of... Like, if you, if you have different iSCSI servers, you would need to bake in the names of the different iSCSI servers into the ZFS binary. Not necessarily. Right? I yeah. Mean, like, you could just make room for a string, and then, um, like, the part of the thing that's interpreting it could. That's kind of why I was proposing the at sign, because we already deal with that for user quota at arbitrary right. username. It, yeah, it, like it doesn't have to exist ahead of time. Well, and that's the part of the, that's perhaps the part of the proposal, the, my version of the proposal I didn't explain very well is it, it would effectively work like that. Like the at operating system part would effectively be yeah. the same as the separate field that I was talking about. I mean, I think the but, goal uh, that you guys are talking about is that you, you want it to be so that for any given software, for any given code base of ZFS, like, ZFS on Lumos, for example. ZFS on Lumos doesn't have to know when Jorgen ports ZFS to some other new crazy operating system, right? Like, Jorgen can port it to like 20 new operating systems, but we don't have to change the Lumos code to know about like all of those operating systems share NFS 
versions, right? Like the Lumos code only needs to know that like there is there is the legacy ShareNFS, there is the Lumos ShareNFS, and like any other things, I just ignore, and that's fine, right? right? I th right. and and yeah, like you can set them, you can do like ZFS set ShareNFS at like whatever you want, and like maybe it'll work if if some other platform pays attention to that, and maybe it won't. Um, but I think that's the I, I think that's the point that, that both of you are getting at, right? Right. I see heads nodding. So um, that sounds like good feedback for George's proposal to make sure that we um, basically like you're able to ignore the other, the platforms that are not yours, um, but also set them without having to add new code for each other platform that might exist. Because it's just a string. Yeah, it's and just they, like, you know, the share NFS property that is for operating system insert string here that we don't validate or care about. Right, and if, you, if your operating system does have a number of choices How do other than just the operating system, you could encode those in the string somehow because its interpretation yeah. is then up to you. You could yeah, say- you could, you could be like, on, 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 you know, like we, there's three different iSCSI servers. You can set prof values for each of them, and then there's some external thing like Etsy, which iSCSI server do you want? And you set that, and then that tells you which one he uses, right. or maybe you can use all of them. Right. It's kind of your OS decision to make then based on what you want to ship and support, I think. So I have this, a question. This, uh, on that and uh, Richard's notes about things like Samba, which are can be the same across all, but I think on Lumos, the SMB server is different. Uh, maybe it even makes sense to just combine the three of these into just a share property. And you just have share at FreeBSD NFS and share at Samba, and the Samba one would work everywhere you have Samba or you know share at the Lumos SMB. I don't know if it m makes sense, but uh, making it less tied to the OS and more to the the implementation of the sharing protocol. So multiple apps, is that going to be supported by the ZFS code? I mean, it could be. Yeah. Or, or <laughs> we'll give you some different syntactic sugar, you know? I think Oracle decided to settle on the period. I think they went share dot SMB app, like, uh, for namespacing reasons, I think. So like, yeah, they, something they, like they, that too. They, they that. Yeah, they did do that. Right. There are multiple ways we could do it, honestly. But uh, my question is, so who is going to decide, how is one going to decide that this is a uh, OS specific property? I think that goes to kind of what I was saying previously about the fact that with ShareNFS, we take the string, we don't validate it, we pass it to the OS specific utility to interpret it. But, um, but that critically ZFS is doing something with it. Yes, exactly. So like when you do ZFS rename or ZFS, you know, set whatever random property, we go and we go and like unshare it and then reshare it later. And um, so that's why it needs to be a system property. And then it needs to be a platform specific property because we aren't validating that string. We're just sending it down to the OS utility. I think it's, it's about hooks, basically. Like, you, you need to do some stuff at particular points in the life cycle of managing file systems and, and pools, pretty much. Uh, with regards to hooks and error management, uh, like Josh, uh, you mentioned that uh, you might want to see rich error handling. So, for example, if a property is not available on a certain platform, that you would actually not just accept the right, but instead return an error and say this is not possible on this platform. So a possible solution that is extensible and would not require recompiling and having patch sets on ZFS would be to use the Lua interpreter, which we I think already have in the code base, to like have custom error checking functions and maybe also migrate the hook code to Lua. It's in the kernel today though, right? Like channel programs are not run in the library. I think. Is that yeah. true? Yeah, it might be, but it, it should not make a difference with regards to portability of the Lua library. Um, I, I didn't quite understand your proposal. Was it, you, are you saying that 
we should provide some, like ZFS should be validating the string rather than just passing it down to the operating specific share utility. And then we should be validating it by having some Lua plugin that lets you provide the validation code. Yeah, that's basically it. So the, the most general form of this proposal would be to have no platform specific hooks in the ZFS core code base, but instead have a generic interface to invoke hooks that are, for example, written in Lua. So we could do the uh, NFS unshare and resharing in Lua, but also validation of the messages that we put in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, that sounds like a pretty big proposal that's like mostly orthogonal to this, I think. I'm thinking about the, the platform support, like consider different Linux distributions and also the additional dimension of uh, different NFS servers, different SMB implementations, different iSCSI implementations. Uh, I can see a pretty big patch set that is unique mm -hmm. per distribution, not just per operating system, but per distribution to actually support that. Like if we want to have the property as a, as a plain string and uh, not do anything specific about it, fine. But uh, if we have these system-like properties, so for example, setting uh, the NFS share attributes or something, uh, as you said, we need to do something in the moment that property is set. And I think the, the amount of combinations explodes if we say, uh, okay, we allow all these different combinations of distribution and software versions or software variants. All right. Uh, well, I, I think that George's proposal is at least an improvement over what we have now. Um, but yeah, like if you, it would be interesting to see what uh, what that would look like in more detail, um, and and you know how how much traction that would get among uh, OS vendors, distro vendors. Um, so, uh, do you want to put together a proposal for that for next time? Uh, I'm not sure I can spend the time on that. I think just like. I think it is a risk that we have to back out of this in like one or two years when all these different variations are present and are out there, then uh, it will be harder to consolidate than uh, because every distribution will have an individual patch for their particular needs. Yeah, but, or, uh, or we end yeah. up with a bunch of code in like ZOL, for example, to try and support all the different iSCSI, you know, servers or whatever. Yeah, and that code will necessarily get out of sync as the different iSCSI servers evolve independently of CFS. That is my my fear in big yeah. air quotes. And right. trying to make it a bit simpler, uh, how about uh, how do you guys uh, going back to the hooks? How do you guys think the hooks should be implemented? For example, it should be just uh, because it could be to some extent just the property could could have uh, like value extension where you put the string and also like handler extension where you put the path to executable that will be passed the string once the property changes or something like that. Or do you think more about like library call or what would there be a idea behind the hooks? I think it is an interesting idea to have the hook be settable by the user, but I think it would uh, like take a little bit of magic out of the whole thing. So uh, I would expect as a user that there be a default hook uh, and that hook would be likely distribution specific. And if I have even more custom needs, then maybe I could override the hook. But in general, I would think that the distribution provides the hook implementation and uh, the ZFS code base only vias the code that sets the property to the invocation of the hook and then ZFS is out of the way. But then we end up back in the same situation where the parameters for the Illumos NFS hook are not understood by the FreeBSD NFS hook. Whereas if we kind of encode as part of the value, which thing is responsible for interpreting it and you import it on one where that doesn't exist, then we just ignore it or something. 
No, I, I still like the proposal still includes that we still have namespace properties per platform or per server. I just think that we shouldn't put that in the like the core ZFS CLI implementation because this will likely evolve to be unmaintainable. All right, well, I think that's good feedback and we're out of time. Um, sorry, Christian, we didn't get to your uh, last agenda item. We'll add it for next for next month. Um, next month, let me. So the next meeting should be March 26th. Um, we'll, I think next month we'll do it this time again. And then maybe uh, the one after that we'll do it earlier. So like maybe two, two at this time and then one at the earlier time. Seems like both times work for a lot of people, so uh, that'll be good. Um, and thanks everyone for participating. We'll see you four weeks from now. Thank you. Bye. Thanks as always, Matt. Ciao, everyone.